certainly appreciate the presence of everyone tonight. And when you when you are engaged in your uh, studies, your reading, what have you, do you ever run across a word that you know that's used quite often, but you just find it uh, uh, interesting just to see how that word is used throughout Scripture? And, you know, it can be a very uh, interesting study. You can, of course, if you have an electronic Bible like I have, you can, you know, look, just do a quick uh, search for that word all throughout the Bible. So I want to do that uh, tonight. Just one word that I've kind of captured my interest is the word shadow. And like I say, I have a electronic Bible so I can do a uh, search on that word. In whatever version I happen to be using, New King James, that word shadow appears about 60 times in the Bible. And it appears more often in the uh, uh, King James. But uh, the reason for that is that in the New King James, sometimes it's uh, used the word shade. But it's the same word anyway. Now, the word can be used in different ways. We use it in different ways in just everyday language. And the Bible does too. So a, a common everyday use of the word is that dark figure that's cast upon the surface by somebody intercepting the rays from a source of light. And typically, it's a, in our case, it's the sun. From this, we gather that there are three aspects for this to be so. First, there's got to be a light source. Then there has, a, has to be an intervening or intercepting body. And finally, a resulting dark semblance of the intervening opaque body cast on some surface. Now, a shadow has no independent existence. It is the result of the interaction between the light source and the opaque body. Like I say, sometimes we use the word shade when we, uh, we're talking about a shadow. And in the King James, shade only appears one time, more often in the New King James. It can be a shadow, but uh, it can also be different intensities of color, such as the shades of red or pink, what have you. And as I say, shade used very seldom in, in the Bible. But when it is used, it typically carries the idea of shade from the sun or from heat. And sometimes it's used in a metaphorical sense. And we were just talking about the my time back on the farm, you know, chopping cotton during the hot summer. But we appreciated a good shade tree, and I still appreciate a good shade tree. And as an aside, just a historical note, the uh, last words spoken by Thomas Stonewall Jackson before he died were, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. Well, it's this physical makeup of a shadow that uh, provides the substance of the various uses uh, uses of the word shadow in the Bible. It is the literal sense of shadow that provides substance to its metaphorical uses. The writer of Hebrews rec recorded in chapter 10, verse 1, that the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. The old law cast the shadow but the law of Christ was the image that is the real thing. Indeed the uh, emphasis of the Hebrew letter was to demonstrate that the old law was but a shadow pointing towards the, the reality of the law of Christ. As one lexicon stated it, this means that the rites formed in the earthly sanctuary, sanctuary could not, they were not intended to effect atonement and forgiveness of sins. 
this concept is set forth in various places in Hebrews, for example, chapter 7, verse 11 uh, and 19, chapter 9, verse 6 following, chapter 10 and 1 following, and uh, all of chapter 11. Their significance consisted in revealing human sinfulness, the alienation of the sinner from God, and the necessity of atonement, and the removal of sin by something better. The saving atonement has been realized in the unique and once for all self-sacrifice of the high priest, Jesus, who offered his own blood in the heavenly holy of holies before God. And again, you find a lot of passages in Hebrews uh, setting that forth. So now that the reality of salvation has appeared in Christ, the time of the copies is over. Uh, Hebrews 8, chapter verse 13, chapter 10, 8 and following, and 18. This is uh, emphasized, as I say, throughout the Hebrew letter and in other places as well, such as in Colossians, the second chapter, verses 16 through 17. That reads there, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. The things commanded in the old law pointed to the Christ. Those things were the shadow. As we might say today, the, the real McCoy is the Christ and his gospel. Another example is found in James first chapter, verse 17, which reads, Every good gift and every perfect gift, gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Again, this embraces the characteristics of a shadow. In this scripture, the writer is contrasting the father of lights with a shadow. In the physical world, our sun is the light. But in the sun, there seemingly are certain changes during the day and throughout the year. It does not shine on all parts of the earth at the same time nor in the same manner during the year. It appears to rise in the east and set in the, the west. It appears to cross the equatorial, equatorial divide and seems to go far to the north and send its rays obliquely on northern reaches of the earth. And then it ascends to the uh, north, recrosses the divide, and then sends its rays obliquely to the southern regions. Of course, we know that is it is not the sun moving across the equator, but the earth revolving around the sun at a tilt to the perpendicular. By reason of revolution of the earth around the sun, the earth's rotation on its axis and its tilt, tilt with respect to its rotation it produces these changes of the seasons and uh, of the day. In contrast, God is not like the sun. With him, there is no variableness, not even the appearance of turning. He is always the same at all seasons of the year and in all ages. There is no change in his character, his mode of being, his purposes and plans. We can take a great comfort in the knowledge that God is the same today as he was yesterday, and he will be the same tomorrow as he is today, which dispels every doubt as to his promises. Now, there are other instances of the use of shadow, which are quite familiar, which employs this metaphor of a shadow. For example, in Psalms, the twenty. Uh, third Psalm, that is, verse 4, we read, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
Here, death is portrayed as continually casting its dreadful shadow on mankind as he walks through life. However, when one is walking with the Lord, when he is our ever-present companion, and when he outfits you with the instruments of a shepherd, then one is fully equipped to meet the trials and tribulations of life. There is no reason to fear evil. We can walk confidently through the valley of the shadow of death. So uh, <clears throat> let's, let's just explore some other uses of the word shadow used in the Old Testament uh, scriptures. In the 91st Psalm, verse 1, we read, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Wherever we go, whatever we suffer, whatever may be our difficulties, temptations, trials, tribulations, or perplexities, as faithful Christians, we are always under the shadow of the Almighty. The shadow of the Almighty is not the occasional abode, but the constant abiding place of the Christian. Here we find our habitation, our home. We ought never to be out of the shadow of God. It is to dwellers, not visitors, that the Lord promises his protection. As we read in the 27th Psalm, verses 4 and 5, <clears throat> One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. <clears throat> For Christians, is a, a very comforting thought that uh, it, uh, that uh, we can abide under the shadow of the Almighty, to always be under the protection and care of our Heavenly Father. As the Apostle Peter wrote, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you, 1 Peter 5th chapter verse 7. Following this taught of, uh, thought of abiding under his shadow, let's uh, look at four descriptions in the Old Testament. It's not all of them, but that make use of this imagery. Uh, each one seemingly a progression of the other. That is, under the shadow of a great rock in a weary land, under the shadow of a tree, closer still, under the shadow of his wing, and nearest and closest, in the shadow of his hand. So let's look at those. <clears throat> First in Isaiah, the 32nd chapter, verses one and two, we read, behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. A man will be as a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. <clears throat> now, the shadow of a great rock is uh, remarkably comforting in a hot, arid climate with the sun beating down. As the shadow of a big rock is a welcome comfort, so is the Lord Jesus eminently comforting to us. A great rock is dense and moderates the ambient temperature in, in its shadow. <clears throat> No oppressive rays penetrate the rock. Its shade is as solid as the rock. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 4, about a rock, he said there, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. If we abide in the shadow of the, that rock, which is Christ, then We'll, we'll have the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse seven. <clears throat> he will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. No sun shall smite us nor any heat, because we are never out of the embrace of the shadow of Christ. 
Now, a second picture <clears throat> is that of the tree. We can find that in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 3. It reads there, Like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great light, and his fruit was to my taste. <clears throat> uh, the uh, King James would say in the shadow, that with great light. So here we have... Uh, not so much refuge from trouble as a special rest in times of joy. The Shulamite, and we'll, we'll just call her the spouse, the Shulamite is apparently wandering through a forest, glancing at many trees. Uh, this is, of course, not to suggest that all spouses do this, but this one was. One tree especially charms her, the apple tree, with its golden fruit that wins her admiration. And she sits under the shadow with great delight. Such was her beloved to her, such as Jesus to the faithful, his bride. The influences of Christ are intended to give us a happy rest. And we ought to avail ourselves of them. We should say with respect to Christ, I sat down under his shade. We find in Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 38 through 42, that Martha was troubled by her sister's marriage in attention to the details of serving. But Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. The words that Jesus spoke to Mary was the good part, which Martha nearly missed by being cumbered with serving. That is the way where we are to walk, the way in which we find rest for our souls, as Jesus was quoted as saying, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew, the 11th chapter, verses 28 through 29. This sitting down in the shade of the apple tree does not mean a rest of idleness and self-content. It is a rest of contentment in the knowledge that Jesus is our Savior. This shadow is also meant to yield perpetual solace, for the spouse did not merely come under it, but there she sat down as one who meant to stay. Under the shadow, she found sweet sustenance. She had no le uh, need to leave it to find a single necessary thing. For the tree which shaded also yielded fruit. Nor did she even rise from a rest, but sitting still, she feasted on the delicious fruit which came down to her. So it is with those who abide in Christ. You can see Matthew, the uh, 15th chapter, verses 1 through 8. The spouse never wished to go beyond her Lord. She knew no higher life than that of sitting under her beloved's shadow. She passed the cedar, oak, and every other good tree. But the apple tree held her, and there she sat down. She made the Lord her dwelling place, Psalms 91, verse 9. The spouse that's not here, that's in Song of Solomon, third verse of chapter 2, it didn't say that she reached up to the tree to gather its fruit, but that she sat down on the ground in intense delight, and the fruit came to her where she sat. Christ will bless those that sit beneath his shadow. The psalmist said, delight yourselves also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. 37th Psalm, verse 4. Under his shadow, we may enjoy delightful rest while being provided eternal security and spiritual sustenance. The third view of the subject uh, under consideration that is shadow is the shadow of his wings. <clears throat> 
this uh, metaphor occurs several times, as in Psalms 63rd Psalm verse 7, because you have been my help, therefore, in the shadow of your wings will I rejoice. The idea here is that the Lord is our refuge in time of trial. In this passage in the Psalms, <clears throat> David was in the wilderness of Judah fleeing from someone, perhaps Saul. He was in dry and thirsty land where there was no water. But what is much worse, he was in a measure away from all conscious enjoyment of God. He says, early will I seek you, my soul thirsts for you in a dry and thirsty land. He remembers his God as he lies on his bed. We also are in a dry and thirsty land and are unable to find any present comfort in a world beset by sin and tribulation, except that we who are in Christ can say, you have been my help. In troublesome times, our faith allows us to rejoice under the shadow of his wings. Our God cannot change, and therefore, as he has been our help, he is now our help. He is still our help. Our help when he casts over us the shadow of his own eternal wings. The metaphor is, of course, uh, derived from the nesting of little birds in the shadow of their mother's wings. The little bird is not yet able to take care of itself, so it shelters under the wings of its mother and is there happy and safe. When we are sick and sorely depressed, when we are worried with our daily cares of whatever nature, when we are tempted by Satan, how comforting it is to run to our God like the little chicks to the hen and hide beneath his wings. Like the little birds which are safe in their mother's love. So we too are beyond measure, secure and happy in the loving, loving favor of the Lord. Jesus himself has declared that he wanted to shelter his people in the shadow of his wings. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verse 37, it is written, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers, gathers her chick under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus was willing, but sadly, the people were not. <clears throat> The last form of the shadow that uh, I'll mention is that of the hand. In Isaiah, the 49th chapter, verse 2, we read, And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of, of his hand has he hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver has he hid me. This undoubtedly refers to the Savior for this section goes on in uh, verses 3 through 8 to state. And he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labor, labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward, reward is with the Lord and my work is with God. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb? to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you may be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Our Lord Jesus was hidden away in the hand of God the Father to be used by him as a polished shaft for the overthrow of his enemies and the victory of his people. Yet it is true also of all those who are in Christ. As he is the savior of the world, so we are the saved out of the world. As he is, so are we also in this world. And in affirmation of this, the same expression used in the 16th verse of the 51st chapter of Isaiah, 
or speaking of his people, he says, I have covered you in the shadow of my hand. There it reads, and I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth and say to Zion, you are my people. Every one of you will who will speak a word for Jesus shall have a share in it. This, this is where those who are workers of Christ should long to be in the shadow of his hand to achieve his eternal purpose. We are but soldiers of the cross. We are but arrows out of the archer's bow, receiving our power from the bowman's string. We ought to be as the arrows of the Lord, which he shoots at his enemies. And so great is his hand of power, and so little are we as his instruments, that he hides us away in the hollow of his hand, unseen until the arrows fly. As workers, we are to be hidden away in the hand of God, or to quote the other figure, in his quiver has he hid me. We are to be unseen until he uses us. It is impossible for us not to be known somewhat if the Lord uses us, but we may not aim at being noticed. On the contrary, if we are as much as the very chief of the apostles, we must truthfully add, though I am though I am nothing, 2 Corinthians 12, chapter verse 11. Our desire should be that Christ should be glorified and that self should be concealed. God only works with those who are in the shadow of his hand. And the more we lie hidden there, the more surely he will use us. May the Lord do unto us according to the, his word. I have put my words in your mouth, and I have covered you in the shadow of my hand. Isaiah the 51st chapter verse 16. Out of weakness, we shall be made strong. And by remaining in the shadow of his hand until the great end of our being, we have the absolute assurance that forevermore we shall dwell in the light that fades not. And with that, the message is yours. Thank you.